Um, but first, this morning, uh, we have another keynote talk um, from one of my favorite people. Um, today, in addition to celebrating your practicum work and achievements, we also celebrate Dr. Lynn Davis, um, a faculty member in PHSP who's retiring this year. Um, although we're not letting her go completely, uh, she'll continue to teach in the program kind of whenever she wants on a sessional basis. And she's already signaled that she's going to come back and teach a course this fall. So she's not going away. She's just sort of changing roles a little bit. However, she is formally retiring. So because PHSP is a small and relatively new school, and our diverse admin and faculty members have had to come together in a fairly quick and really cohesive way, I have to say, to develop a coherent and student-centered program. It, for us, it's a big deal when one of our members is transitioning to a new stage. So um, we've asked Lynn today, as part of her celebration as she uh, transitions, um, to share her wisdom with us in a keynote this morning. Um, and as I hope you all know, today's lunch will be a PHSP-sponsored pizza lunch, and we're going to have a little celebration for Lynn at lunchtime as well. So if you have funny little anecdotes that you'd like to tell about Lynn, that would be a perfect time to do it. <laughs> or maybe just throw her bouquets, whatever. Um, so uh, yes, so lunchtime today will be all about Lynn, and there'll be pizza, and I'll tell you more about the details when we get closer to lunchtime. Uh, since Lynn will be speaking about herself and her career, I, I won't say too much to introduce you. I'll just maybe toss a little word salad at you. Um, she's a seasoned instructor who invests a lot of energy in her teaching, and she's been a senior instructor in our school since 2012, which was pretty much when we started. She's a dog person. She's a passionate activist. She's a poet. She's a radio DJ. She's a parent. She's a loving partner. She lives with Lyme. She's funny, she's fierce, she's an LGBTQ advocate, she's honest, she wears her heart on her sleeve, and she's a trusted friend. She, I'm gonna get teary here. <laughs> she won the HSD Teaching Excellence Award in 2013, and we love her to bits. So without further ado, Lynn. We're a very close school. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm very grateful to be standing on this land and near this water that generations and generations and generations of people who spoke the Lekwungen language and the Sankofan language have cared for. I'm also very grateful to be a resident on the Esquimalt traditional territories. There are lots of other traditional territories on which I've lived, and I wanted to show you some of them. So as I talk about the traditional territories, I'm also going to use the colonizer's name because some of these nations are, are small and are now extinct, and you might not have heard of them. I was born on the land of the Tequesta, down here. And I grew up there and on the territory of the Tocobago. This map here says Seminole. I know it's hard to see. So those two tribes, as they're called in, the United, in what's now the United States, be, were, were comparatively small tribes that were hunter-gatherer tribes that lived on the water. And when the Spaniards came, those tribes were pretty quickly decimated by disease, by being taken into slavery, and by war with the Spaniards. And so the Seminole tribe emerged. Remnants of the existing tribes joined with Africans who escaped from the slave trade to form the Seminole Nation. And the Seminole Nation is the only federally recognized tribe in the US that does not have a treaty with the US. This is one case where the colonizers were not able to defeat them. 
I also have lived on the land of the Catawba in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where I did most of my undergraduate work. And I did some graduate work and also lived on the land of the Mohawk, which is around Albany, New York. I spent most of my adult life until I was 50. This says Choctaw, but it's the land of the, specifically of the Appalachee, and that is in Tallahassee, Florida. Or once I get a beer in me, I'll say it's Tallahassee. <laughs> I'm a Southern girl, too. I also got to spend four years on the land of the Arapaho, which is Denver, Colorado. And now, as I said, I live on the territory of the Esquimalt Nation. So these are my people. Um, when my first great niece was born, my brother asked me if I would go on Ancestry to develop a family tree, and I did. And I found that I am pretty much 100% settler. So my um, father's side came to the United States from Germany in the 1840s when there was war and what was called the unification of the nation that became Germany. This is my paternal grandfather, William Henry Davis, and my maternal great aunt, Mabel Davis Temple. And um, she really served as my grandmother. She was a very independent woman who um, graduated from university at 16, lied about her age, began teaching at age 17, and then when she wanted to retire, they wouldn't let her retire because she hadn't reached retirement age. They wouldn't acknowledge that she'd lied about her age. And she didn't get married until she was 80. And my brother said, well, Aunt Mabel, why did you wait so long to get married? And she was four feet, 10 inches tall, and she pulled herself up to her full height and glared at him and said, young man, I never found anyone suitable until I met Truman. So I loved her. She was great. Then here is my grandfather, William Henry Davis, with my father, Richard Eugene Davis. And that photo, when I first saw it, I thought it was my father with my brother, but it isn't. It's the generation before. My mother's side comes from the British Isles, from what's now England and Ireland. This is my maternal grandfather, Paul Edward Fisk, in the mountains of western Massachusetts on their family farm outside Huntington holding a pig. This is my maternal grandmother, Evelyn Jean Bame Fisk, for whom I was named. I don't know much about her because she died when my mother was four, but I love this photo of her with a dog, and I think that I got more from her than just her name. This is my mother, Esther Fisk Davis, Esther Jean Fisk Davis. Both she and my father were born in 1918. And I want to pause in this and say that I'm very privileged to have these family photos. My friends and loved ones who grew up in foster care or who grew up in poverty have no photos of themselves. They have no photos of their families. And I want to acknowledge that. So I think this was probably taken in 1950 or 1951. Yes, I'm absolutely that old. And this is my brother Paul and me outside our family home in um, Miami, Florida. And then here I am in full drag, <laughs> right there. This is the summer of 1965 when I was installed as a worthy advisor of the Mark Sexton chapter of the Order of Rainbow for Girls. In this photo, we look like an affluent normal family. But we had just emerged from a few years of chaos. My father was hospitalized for severe depression. And for reasons that I came to understand later, my mother refused to work. And so my memory of those times are that we didn't have enough money for electricity or for food or for water, much less for clothes or for books. But there was always money for booze and cigarettes. And that time of being so desperately poor I think has shaped me in indelible ways. 
So in addition to my biological family, I've been very blessed to have other families. And they're going to play a part in what I talk about later, so that's why I'm taking this time to tell you about them. This is Leona LeBlanc, who was my partner when I lived in Florida. And these two gentlemen here, Mike Bailey and Chris Bailey, I consider to be my sons. I met them when I was four. I was very lucky to be able to be an important part of their coming to adulthood, and I'm still connected to them today, as well as to Leona. And I remember when I took this, when we had this photo taken, I was so nervous. This is the first men's shirt I ever bought. I still have it. Um, and I just thought I looked so butchy. And now I look at it and I go, not really. But anyway. And then this is me and Janet Rabinovich in Thailand several years ago. Janet was an incredibly important activist here in the Victoria area. And she passed away more than 10 years ago. She also um, has two children, um, but un in the process of losing Janet, I also lost contact with her kids, and so I didn't feel it was appropriate to include um, photos of her children, who are now very successful adults, also out there making a huge difference in the world. And finally, this is my beloved Patty. We took this photo got taken at um, the Queer as Funk dance. And I'm in my favorite outfit, which is my tuxedo. And these are my elders. These are women I met at the Michigan Women's Music Festival. They're part of my tribe. They've all passed on. Uh, three of the four died in 2015, which was the last year of the festival. But I wanted them to be with me today, and they are. So I wanted to. to um, because I have tortured especially the bachelor's students with making them learn Excel, I thought it only fair to use Excel to enter data and to create a graph. So that is what I've done. So this is how I've earned money. I've had a lot of jobs. And I only included the ones that were full time that I had for longer than 18 months. And I know that you're not able to read this, but I can say that mostly I have worked in state legislative settings, developing policy and doing program evaluations. I've also worked in private not-for-profit um, corporations, uh, one time with an advocacy group, another time with a group that was working with different state legislatures. Um, I've also produced women's music. I've cleaned houses. I've delivered the New York Times. I've delivered the Wall Street Journal, um, mowed lawns, repaired houses. Um, my last few years in the United States, I was a private sector management consultant. And then when I came up here, I established my own management consultant business so that I could live here but work in the States until I became a landed immigrant. And then, and I continued that consulting for a few years after I became a landed immigrant. I first taught at the university in the fall of 2002, and except for three summers, I've taught every term since. So as you can see, that's my real long-lasting job. And I feel that in teaching, everything that I've done in the past, even delivering the newspapers, has fit into teaching, and I feel like I have found my passion. And I have found work that loves me as much as I love it, and I am so grateful for it. So I've been a sessional in the School of Nursing, Child and Youth Care, Social Work, and Public Administration, and then I've been a Senior Instructor or Assistant Teaching Professor in Studies and Policy and Practice, the Dispute Resolution Program in Public Administration, and now, for the last five years, blessedly, public health and social policy. I've been able to do work I love with people I love. And it has made a profound difference in who I am, not only inside, but also out in the world. And clearly, I'm right on the edge of tears because I am so grateful. So thank you all for hiring me. Thank you for opening your hearts and your minds to me. This has been an amazing journey. So in my courses, 
I included a lot about activism. And though of, those of you who have taken Health 403 or PHSP 551 with me have known all these terms. I'm not going to give a pop quiz on who remembers Cressman and Knight or Orlowski. But instead, I just wanted to bring these terms up to ground my presentation in the work that we've done together. But rather than talk in an academic way about activism, I want to talk about what I've learned from my lifetime as an activist. And a lot of these things I know are things that you already know. And that's wonderful. But I offer them to you as a sign of my gratitude for your desire to learn and for your work and for your senses of humor and your indulgences of me. So this is my beloved friend, Francis. And let's see if I can get to the... Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. I don't use a Mac. Maybe it's up here. Is it up here? Sorry. Your instructor is human, too. Can I get some help from? Ah, uh, thank you. Oh, maybe I did it? Almost there. OK, I just don't see it on my screen. I'm sorry. Come on, Francis. So I met Francis at the Michigan Women's Music Festival. We were entering accounting charge slips into the Zahn machine. And two sentences into our first conversation, I knew I had met a friend for life. She passed away in August 2015 of a form of Alzheimer's disease. But this is from 2005. Thank you. Uh, I spent, I don't know, 30 years pissed off, angry, banging on tables, shouting at people. And I think that anger is a completely appropriate response in the moment to an evil that you see being done or something you want to change. It makes total sense to me. But I actually think that what moves people is love, real love. And the secret to love is loving. And if we can crank open our hearts and actually love each other and let it in and let it out, we're going to be better. We're going to be stronger. We're going to recognize that we have managed to survive. We're going to see the survival and the spirit of survival in everyone around us. And we're going to be able to compassionately deal with what's going on. We're going to stop marginalization of people who are poor and different. We're going to be able to welcome strangers into our midst and not be afraid. We will vanquish fear. And fear is what's at the bottom of all of this. And if we can do that, if we can find compassion and recognize it in ourselves and others, then we have a chance. We just have to start. We just have to start. And for me, the starting place is cranking open my heart. Thank you. So this is a phrase I learned from Janet, be the bridge. And I want to give two examples. The first one is with the Children Matter Coalition in Surrey. I was hired to teach the agencies that comprise this coalition to teach their staff how to do program logic models, because that's what Health Canada was requiring for to continue to fund these groups. So we set up a four-hour training session. And about 20 minutes into it, I realized that this was not the way to go. These were people who worked in very small agencies with very few resources, who were experts at network and at brokering. And they didn't really care about the difference between a short-term outcome, a medium-term outcome, or a long-term outcome. So I said, let's not do it this way. What if I come and spend a day with each of you, and we'll talk about what data you have? And then I'll put that into a logic model. And if I think you need to collect some other data, we can talk about it and figure out what works for you. And that worked. That worked really well. So they could 
prove to Health Canada that their programs were successful based on this program logic model, but they didn't have to create um, additional data just for the purposes of the logic model. So in that way, I think I was a bridge for them between the community level and the federal level. The second example is work I did with the Victoria Lesbian Seniors Care Society. And we um, were funded by the status of women to survey community-based programs that provided services to seniors. And we wanted to find out, did they know there were lesbians in their clientele? And if so, did they do any kind of programming with their staff or their other clients so that lesbians would be acknowledged and feel welcome and safe? Um, I did find out that there are no lesbians at Souk, which was really an amazing surprise to me as well as to the 12 other lesbians I know who live in Souk. But once we got that cleared up, <laughs> um, so, so anyway, it was a long, lovely process. The staff of the agencies were very welcome. But one of the things that I did is I walked through each, where each one of these programs was conducted, and I thought, would I feel safe here? And I never saw myself reflected on the walls. There were lots of photos of white heterosexual couples. And, you know, my brother is a white heterosexual couple. I love him dearly, but that's not me. So what we came up with, the bridge, was two members of the Victoria Lesbian Seniors Care Society agreed to sit for a poster. And the agencies put this up. And so it was a bridge between people who used the services and the staff so that the staff didn't have to say, oh, are you a dyke? Well, you're welcome here, no problem. They, this poster just said a lot. So this poster, I think, was a bridge. The second thing is to be a translator. And I was compelled to use this clip art of the football. So in the American South, football is not just a sport, it's a religion. And my younger son was on the high school football team. And I was part of the parental support group. And I had two missions, one of which I was reasonably successful in, and the other one at which I failed. So the one in which I was reasonably successful is um, the parents had the tradition of getting absolutely dead drunk at all the away games. And um, I thought that wasn't appropriate behavior, not only because I come from an alcoholic family, but also young males love to drink. And I think if they see their parents doing it in public places and throwing up in the stands, it's not really the best thing. So I had to translate my feelings about booze and about their being what I wanted them to be, as opposed to what they might want to be, um, into language that people could understand. And so what I began to talk about with them was, well, what if there's a recruiter in the stands and they want to talk to you about your son? but you're too inebriated to form a complete sentence. Wouldn't you want to make that connection and provide that opportunity for your son to get a scholarship to go to college? That worked. The other thing I really wanted to do was, you know, I don't know if, I assume you all have seen football games. There's a person at the side who um, holds a stick that marks the downs, and I really wanted to do that, but I was never able to do it, but boy, did I try. <laughs> Then the other way to be a translator is when you talk with people in power. So this is Randall Garrison. He's my MLA. He's a member of the NDP, and he's an out gay man. So what kind of language would I use with him? How would I translate what I would like him to do into language he would understand? I would use language from the socialist ideology, and I would also talk about gay and lesbian issues. So this is Maureen Karaginas, who is currently my member of parliament, but she's not running again. And this is the Esquimalt City Council, and that is Barb Desjardins, who is running for the liberals. So if she is elected, how would I speak to her? I would talk about the importance of the individual. I would use that ideology, right? So that's part of being a translator. And all my 551 students are rolling their eyes going, yeah, yeah, we get it, it's okay. 
So also look for allies and advocates in unlikely areas. And I've got two examples here from when my Florida days. I worked in a legislature um, when abortion had just become legal federally and when Roe v. Wade was um, decided by the Supreme Court. But each state had to enact its own laws to allow abortion. It was a very hot topic. And the Roman Catholic Church was very much against allowing abortion. So we were tasked with developing some legislation to create licensing standards for child care. There were no licensing standards for child care in Florida at the time. And my committee chair asked me to help him identify possible advocates. And I thought, what about the church? They really love kids. And so the, the Roman Catholic Church turned out to be a big advocate for us. And from my own personal perspective, I wouldn't have thought of them. But they were an advocate. They were our allies. Then this building here, this mansion on the shores of a lake in Lakeland, Florida, is owned by the Junior League. The Junior League is a big thing in the United States. And it's mostly women who, who have enough income that they don't have to work outside the home. Um, I think they're, they're, they come in at age 25. They stay in till age 40. And um, I used to think of them as women who lunch. Um, I never thought I had very much in common with them. And then I was working at the Center for Children and Youth in Florida. And we had gotten a grant from the Department of Justice who wanted kids who were held in adult jails to be separated from the adults by both sight and sound. So I was going around to the 67 counties in Florida to find out if they held kids in adult jail, and if so, which you know, under what conditions. So in Polk County, which is kind of in the center of the state, and at the time was very agricultural and pretty rural, the sheriff said, yeah, you bet we throw them in a drunk tank. They skip school, we pick them up, bingo, they're there. And sometimes we don't call their parents for a couple days. So I went to the judge. He says, no, kids are bad. That's what's going to happen. I went to the school principals. They thought it was a great idea. I went to the editor of the paper. He didn't see anything wrong with it. So when I was back in the office, I was saying, I don't know what to do. And, uh, and a woman a little bit older than me who had volunteered there said, what about the Junior League? And I fell off my chair laughing, you know, like, really? Come on. And she said, I was a member of the Junior League. And I thought, OK, I'll put my foot on my mouth now. Um, but anyway. She called, she found out who all these guys' wives were. She set up a lunch date, and I got to be a lady who lunches. And the aim of the Junior League is to better their community. And within three months of that first lunch, there was not one kid held in adult jail. So just where you think you can't find people who will help you, you can. And then there's using the right language. And this always evolves. I just love this cartoon. Can you read it? It says, undocumented immigrants refuse to learn local language, still get food assistance. Very appropriate in the US under Trump, um, for whom I did not vote. What a surprise. So these are some of the things that I've learned about using the right language. At the Michigan Women's Music Festival, I quickly learned that with deaf and hard of hearing folks, it's really important for me not to talk like this. They need to be able to see my face. And that having appropriate lighting is really important. So if we're outside, for example, I'm going to stand with my face in the sun rather than them so they have a better chance of understanding me. I've also learned a little bit of American Sign Language, but just a very little bit, but enough that we can converse. So this way, I can do the right language. The other kind of language that I had to learn is when I moved up here. There's a lot of variation in what words mean. So like when I met Patty, my wife, um, she would tell me these tales about her family going to the cabin in the white shell. And they'd all load up. 
And then they'd stop at the store before they got to the cabin, and all the kids would fight to sit on the two four. And she, but the third time she told me this story, I just finally had to tell her what was in my head. And I said, so what I see is the back seat is loaded with pieces of two by four lumber, and the kids are on top. <laughs> and she said, no, it's beer. And then I went, oh, that's what I would call a case of beer, but it's a two four. So the point of this is that their different words have different meanings in different contexts. And if you've ever seen Geist magazine, I couldn't, couldn't find it on the internet. I was going to sh show it to you. But they do a map of Canada with all the different terms that even though you're Canadian, you may or may not know. And then there are, of course, things that we all know. So like, I don't call my gay male friends fags. I just don't. They can call each other that, but I would never do it. And then there's the ever-evolving use of pronouns. And I have really struggled from years of taking Latin and diagramming sentences to use they for the first person um, singular, but I think I've kind of got the habit of it. So be aware of language and try to use the right language in the right situation. Also know what you're willing to pay. There have been times that I have made conscious decisions about what I will and won't do that have directly affected my pocketbook. When I worked for, uh, for the Office of the Auditor General in Florida, I did a program audit of the way the Division of Health created its budget request. I turned it into my supervisor. She liked it. It went to review. They liked it. The Deputy Auditor General said, these aren't the right findings. So my supervisor made an appointment with the deputy auditor general, and we went, and I was told, this is what you have to find. And I decided I wasn't going to do it because it would have seriously undercut the population health programs that the division was doing, and also there wasn't the data to support it. And I knew that meant the end of my career at the Auditor General. And in fact, I was fired 10 days later. Um, and then they turned around and they found a fellow whose adult son, who didn't have health insurance, had just been in a very severe accident and was a quadriplegic. And they asked him to do it. So while I'm very, very sad that my colleague got saddled with that very, in my opinion, unethical situation, I made that decision. And you all have probably faced similar things. And then, of course, know what you're willing to pay when you're talking with family and friends. And I think all of us have had that experience of going, deciding not to say, or deciding to say. And there's one time that still sticks with me that I haven't resolved. So last summer, I went to a poetry workshop. It was a big deal because when, I, when the line was most virulent in my body, I completely lost my ability to write poetry. But it was beginning to come back. And so I was a week with this amazing teacher and these amazing poets, and I could feel my brain open again and feel my life come back to me. And on the way home, I stopped in Parksville at McDonald's <laughs> to get a McDouble and a small fry. And I was sitting at the table just really enjoying this junk food, right? And there was a gentleman next to me who was talking about how he had immigrated from Canada to Canada about the same time I did. And he was saying the most virulent, hateful things about homosexual people. And I wanted so badly to speak to him. And I didn't have the guts because he was so angry and I was so triggered. And so instead, I sat there with the food, a cold, hard lump in my gut and found myself hoping that he would look at me and see me as a man, not as a butch. I was that threatened. So there are times that we say, I can't pay that. That's the price. I can't pay it. That's part of being human. So occasionally, and this is very un-Canadian, warning, smuggle. 
When I worked in the Florida legislature, I was assigned to rewrite the purchasing chapter. I can assure you that is probably the most boring law ever written. And as I was working on it, some people came to me from, from a differently abled advocacy group and said, do you know how people in this state get state-funded prosthetics? And I said, no, I don't. And they said, well, they have to travel to Jacksonville. And then they make an appointment, and they go to the warehouse. And they go through the shelves. And whatever fits them, that's what they get. And so that means that people who used to be able to work before they had an accident at work probably couldn't work because the prosthetic didn't really fit them, and they got secondary infections and all kinds of things. And the state used to create custom-made prosthetics for each person who needed state assistance. And they said, can you help us? And I thought about it. And it was literally two lines in a whole chapter of law, like probably 35 pages of this, of this law. And I thought about it, and I suggested some language, and they said yes. And so I put that language in. But I didn't mention it in the bill analysis. I didn't even mention it to my staff director. Probably could have been fired for that, much less the chair of my committee. But it passed. And people were again able to have custom-made prosthetics. So that's an example of smuggling. Occasionally lie. This is very un-Canadian, I know. <laughs> so when I worked in the House Rules Committee, my job was to work with the chair and the staff director to decide what bills would go to the floor and when they would go. And the Everglades was a complete bloody mess. And the fellow who was the chairman of my committee was a passionate environmentalist. And we had this package of legislation that would have severely curtailed farming in the Everglades, would have undammed the rivers, would have let the Everglades be a swamp again, a really wide river. And we had barely gotten it through the different committees. Well, the big sugar lobbyists were at my door every day. When is this bill going to come up? When is this bill going to come up? And there came the day that I knew the day the bill was going to come up, but I didn't know the time. And so they came in and said, when is this bill going to come up? And I looked them square in the eye and I said, I don't know, guys, sorry, because I didn't know the time, but I knew the day. And so the bill went through the House before they had a chance to lobby against it. So occasionally, lie. And then threaten. <laughs> this is also very not Canadian. So when the liberals first came into power, Janet Rabinovich was still alive, and she had helped form peers the Prostitutes Empowerment Education and Resource Society. And one of the things that the, that the people at Peers, all of whom are sex trade workers, and Janet had done, was to begin to compile a list of Johns, or people who buy sex. And they were trying to get the Times colonists to publish the list. Times colonists didn't think that was a very good idea. But anyway, a lot of people knew that this list was floating around. And so when the liberals came in, I happened to get a list of the programs that they wanted to cut in the first three years. And I was on the board of Bridges for Women, which is a program that provides bridging programs, which are, are programs for people who've endured several cycles of severe abuse. And bridging programs were to be cut in the second year, and I thought over my dead body. So we first went to all the female MLAs. They were, of course, on our side. We began to approach the male MLAs to get enough votes to get that off the list, or at least to work with us to get that off the list. And we couldn't get enough people. So then Janet and I came up with the idea that we were going to go visit people together. Hi, I'm Lynn Davis. I'm on the board of Bridges for Women. Hi. I'm Janet Rabinovich. I'm the executive director of Peers, the Prostitutes Empowerment Education and Resource Society. We're here together to talk to you about bridging programs, and we really hope you'll keep the funding of them. That's all we had to say. The implication was there. They've got the list, and if you think you might be on it, maybe you'd want to think about this funding. So bridging programs still exist. Again, all these are very un-Canadian but consider them. This is probably the most important one. Connect your heart to someone else's. 
That requires a deep listening and for me a settling in. And when somebody is speaking to me, not running in my head what I'm going to say back, but really listening, cranking my heart open, as Francis would say. And the area in which I've most recently done this is with people I love who have decided to transition to the other gender. And that when they were women, I personally, I took it personally that they wanted to transition, like because that meant that being a woman wasn't good enough. And I listened and I listened and I finally got that that was absolutely the right decision for that person. And then we connected. And I'm very grateful I was able to do that. So that says radical listening and it's on a fire. Try it, it's really cool. Also have fun, sing, dance, play, protest. These are some of the artists that I really love and some of the protests that I've done that really inspire me. And here's a plug for CFEV, Victoria's alternative voice. Finally, be yourself. This is, well, it's not the final one, but it's close to the final one. This is really complicated. And I want to acknowledge that as a white person with an education, I have a lot of privilege. And I also have the choice even though it may feel very theoretical to me, to let my hair grow and to start wearing dresses again and to pass as a traditional woman. People of color don't have that choice. Indigenous people don't have that choice. They can't do things with their bodies that make them be labeled than other than who they are. So it is complicated. I personally think that who I am, which is one of the great gifts that Canada has given me, is to be able to express physically who I am. I just lost my thought. Sorry. Anyway, it's a privilege, it's complicated, and I'm very grateful. Keep your sense of humor. So these are two examples from teaching. I can't imagine that any of us has loved either teaching or taking a research course online. It's really a bear, right? So here we have the world's most accurate pie chart. Pie I've eaten, pie I have not yet eaten. <laughs> and then the other really ugh part about teaching is marking papers. So here we have paper grading bingo. Insert yourself into the political realm. So these are people from my tribe at Michigan, the closing of the last Michigan Women's Music Festival. I was last with them in August 2015. In February of this year, I was able to be with some of them, and I heard Aisha Moody Mills speak. She was the um, staff director, chief of staff for Michelle Obama. She said this, it may buy blood rain cold, because I know it's true. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So I encourage you, sit on commissions and boards your school boards, whatever is out there, no matter how small, volunteer, be on those, be at the table. Run for office. I know, people, like, she said that, and I was like, yeah, right. But think about it. Think about it. This is a multi-party system. Think about running for office. Run for school board, you know? That's where the right really gets its tentacles in, is in the school system. Walk your neighborhood. Talk to your neighbors about issues that are important to you. If there's a candidate you endorse, go door to door. Tell people why you support this person. Vote. My mother worked in the Florida legislature, and she was the second woman ever or in the whole history to do something other than secretarial work, and that is not to disparage secretarial work. It is to honor my mother's courage and tenacity to begin to do other kinds of work. And she would say many times, they're going to put some idiot in office that might as well be your idiot. And she knew a lot of them. And not all of them are idiots, but a lot of them are. So here's the BC election. If you're from BC, these are the dates. Please, 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 please vote. It's really important. Finally, take really good care of yourself. This is the Michigan Women's Music Festival in 1979. I'm the white lesbian in blue jeans. Um, I encourage you to immerse yourself in situations where you are deeply confirmed and you are deeply challenged. 
I also encourage you to do the deep personal work that you need to do to be an adult and to be present. Social justice I experience as very triggering. And so here I am with my shirt that says poems, not prisons. And I had just finally figured out that the depression in which I had lived my whole life was not some abyss poured onto me by my parents and my grandparents. It was instead my frame that was around me, and I could dispel the fog. And I was so excited. So do that deep personal work. Exercise, be out in nature. Take care of other beings who are dependent on you. These are our dogs, Nellie and Phoenix, and we're in Francis King Regional Park. Surround yourself with equally weird people and love them deeply. This is my friend Monica Kendall and my best friend Susan Strega. And in closing, I want to read to you a poem written by Christos, who is, um, she is Menominee. She is lesbian in two spirit. She lives in Bay. Bridge, Washington, and um, she cleans houses for a living. She has five books out. She occasionally comes here. If you ever have a chance to go hear her, please do. This is prayer for her students, which I am using with Christos's permission and blessing. The unbearable light of failure pours across my hands, twisted with scrubbing and lost hope. So I push myself to think of others, to think of you. May you never be caught here fighting back bitterness with every breath. May your work be welcomed. May you walk in respect. May you be remembered beyond this day when I face you broken. May my brokenness empower you to a freedom I'll never know. May my tears wash your heart free of cruelty. May you grow roses and vegetables with equal ardor, feeding soul as well as belly. May you never be ashamed of your tears or hide your passion or pretend your anger is not crucial for change. May you never lose courage to understand your motives, your actions, your goals. May you come to love yourself despite the barrage of hatred, which is this war where we live. May you come, may you become, may you be the love, the woman, the man, the person, the flight. I have risked everything, given everything to see. The future is yours, my friends. Love the present, do good work, do justice, and thank you for letting me into your lives. Okay. Big butches do cry. First, I have to before, I have to give Lynn a hug before you ask questions. Hmm. All right. So I will walk the mic around while I wipe the tears out of my eyes. Who's got a question for Lynn or a comment? There's one back there. Yay. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Lynn, so much for sharing your reflections. And I especially appreciate the courage in sharing things that you've struggled with. Thank um, you, Carl. So that's a great example to hear. Um, I'm wondering if you have any reflections on, in doing social justice work, um, experiences working in the government versus working in non-government sectors, and just how you feel about affecting change in those different places as we decide where would be the right fit for us. OK. Um, 
So I've also done work provincially here, but as a consultant, which is different than being an employee. My experience is that when I work in or with the public sector, sector I have to be a lot more clever, I have to be a lot more considered. Um, think about strategy, think about goals, be really active in identifying advocates and allies, and, and that's when language becomes really, really, really important. Like, um, I couldn't understand everything that Bela said yesterday because my hearing aid was going <sighs> But I think she talked a lot about that, about taking that care, whereas if I'm not in the public sector, I can more shoot from the hip. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? I'm looking for hands. Oh, you're so quiet this morning. Reflections. There we go. I was wondering um, what you thought about moving from the states to Canada in terms of like the healthcare system and how everything operates. Uh, yeah. How much time do we have? Um, I never thought I would be old enough to see the kind of society where I can walk free as who I am. Um, I value this Canadian society so much because of our social safety net. I can't begin to describe to you the level of poverty in the United States. And yes, we have poverty here. We have unspeakable poverty on the reserves. We have unspeakable poverty in the big cities. But it's a little bit different than in the States or a lot big different because in the States, you are expected to provide for yourself. There is no sense of, this is my contribution to our well-being. It's a huge difference. And if I hadn't had health insurance, I probably would have been, I would have gone into personal bankruptcy. If I had lived in the United States and had Lyme, I probably would have lost my job. Um, and I probably would have had to declare personal bankruptcy because I wouldn't have had health insurance and I would have had to pay for everything. Um, the main cause of personal bankruptcy in the United States are health care costs. Yeah. Like one of my friends teaches in North Carolina. She has Crohn's disease. And um, she'll probably have to go on welfare because she won't be able to pay for her treatments and she won't be able to work. She's a university professor. It's grim. Yeah. Other questions? Yay, Canada. Looking for hands. Uh, I'll ask and we're you, not perfect. I'll ask you one, Lynn. It's, yes. Uh, it's uh, sort of a, on the same theme as a question that Bailey yeah. got yesterday, and I, I'm sorry I've forgotten who asked, but it's that question about, or the theme of, uh, in your career journey, <laughs> How much do you... Career. It only looks like a career well, now. Well, you know, yeah, now. but, but, but that's, I guess that's part of the question, yeah. right? Is in your journey, how much of that... Ooh, I'm buzzing. How much of that is chosen? Like, how much do you actively go out and seek new opportunities? And how much of it just comes as part of the process? Oh, boy. Um, for me, it's been very rare that I've chosen like when I've made major jumps. Um, my dad used to say he was so glad that he and my mom had two of us, and he, what he meant was a boy and a girl, but he really had two of us. He had one straight kid, he had one queer kid, he had one kid who decided to become a mathematician in high school and just retired from the university after being a mathematician his whole life, and then he had a daughter who just said, Ooh, that one, I'll do that one. Or ooh, this one, I'll do this one. Like, I, I think I get bored really easily. And so most of it has been jumping from one to the other. The, the constant thread has Sorry, been the desire to bring about change. Dwayne has a question. Okay. I think Dwayne has a pull up. Hi, Lynn. Uh, thank you for your amazing presentation and just to share with us your um, amazing uh, journey. Uh, my question to you now where you stand is, um, what do you see as your leadership philosophy now? Hmm. Wow. 
I think my leadership philosophy is really based on radical listening, um, of that deep, deep listening. Like Rumi says, or one of his many poems is, I would sell my tongue and buy a thousand ears. And I think that by doing that listening, that then we can figure out what we need to do together and how we can move forward. Welcome. Time for one more, if there is one more. No? Well, we'll, we'll have a chance to continue dialogue um, yes. at lunchtime and through the day, of course. Um, but thank you, Lynn, so much for sharing thank a little you. bit of yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you.